How good is the fishing in New Zealand? It's great, as we'll show you on this episode of FCO Fishing NZ, when we head off for a bit of downtown snapper fishing right in front of the Sky Tower in Auckland City. We will share some of our top tips on tackle and techniques for catching more fish. Also, find out why are our Spiros blowing bubbles. Leaving the boat ramp at Westhaven Marina, you could see all the people heading off to work in the usual rush of Auckland early morning traffic. I barely had time to set up my sounder and organise a bit of gear before we started fishing. It almost seemed wrong that I didn't get to push the throttles down on the new boat before we were at the fishing grounds between West Haven and Stanley Point in the middle of the Waitemata Harbour. It's easy to head off over the horizon in the boat and drive right over the fish. Snapper are migratory fish that means they often come into harbours and estuaries for spawning and Auckland Harbour is no different. It just happens that the fish have decided to hold up right in the middle of town. I've had about uh, half a dozen casts just working things out and uh, I've caught my first little fish. It's only a, only a tiddler, but I've seen some signs on the sounder. So I know my system's working right. We're on the fish zone. Just need to get some decent sized ones now. And literally didn't even get the, uh, the engine warmed up to get out here. See if I can get a decent sized fish now. This one feels a bit better. I'll tell you one thing, um, it's great fishing so close to town, but you have to be a little bit careful because there's so much traffic. There's ferries and uh, container ships and everything there everywhere. So you have to really keep your wits about you, watch what's going on, watch out for wakes and all that, and definitely keep a, an eye out for these ferries because they fear motor around town. This feels like quite a nice fish. This fish is putting up a, a nice struggle. It's uh, fighting quite well. Oh, it's a good panny. Just uh, slide him in the net. The boat is officially christened. Right in the middle of town. That's a nice little eating sized fish. A couple of three of those and I'll be really happy this morning. We're only coming out for a quick trip and uh, you know, Five minutes from town, not even five, two. Excellent fishing. So what I'm doing is I'm using my track lines from the Lowrance HDS7. So I go back up my track line and uh, come back and that, I use that for my drift to indicate where I'm drifting. And I pretty much know where I'm picking up the fish so I can go back to that area and I can concentrate that so I enhance my fishing time. The rig I was using was the new Z-Man Street Z in the new penny colour on a half ounce jig head with a five burrow hook. I was adding a bit of secret sauce and garlic and anchovy to the lure as an extra enticer. The rod and reel was a Daiwa Exila with a surtape reel spooled up with 4kg high visibility black magic inferno braid and I was using 20 pound black magic fluorocarbon leader. This rig was really nice and light and had really good sensitivity for staying in contact with the lure and telling the difference between bumps on the bottom and bites. So I've just cast up and my line's starting to drift at the back of the boat so what I was talking about we uh, do drag fishing which is fishing the soft bait behind the boat. There we go! Oh yeah! <laughs> right on cue! <laughs> I'd only let one little bit of line back that time and this is pretty much the very next cast since that last fish. So you're talking about pretty good quality fishing here. And that's, that's one of the great things about fishing in New Zealand. We are really blessed. You don't have to go for 100 miles to find quality fishing. But the other thing is we've got a pretty good fishing network. And one of the reasons I knew to come here was I've been talking to all my mates who are 
fishermen and charter boat skippers and they said, if you go past North Head, you're going too far. This is where all the fish are. So uh, we decided to come and give it a go and obviously paid rewards. We've been out here now for about an hour. I've got three fish already and uh, we're having a great time. So I'll put this one in the, the well. One more fish and then we'll probably go for a look, just try some uh, different country. Coming up, secrets for dirty water diving. We all love to dive clear blue water, but living in New Zealand means we get our fair share of dirty stuff to dive in. This just means we have to learn to adapt and do the best we can with what we've got. Paul Marlin will demonstrate what he does in dirty conditions like this to attract kingfish. Have a listen to this. Making noises like this will work on many different game fish, but remember, it will limit your dive time as you're expelling precious air. Time your dive to allow for it. Lying in kelp like this can be good to hide your intentions towards a fish. It can also be used to completely camouflage yourself. Pause at it again. Persistence generally pays off. We heard them before we saw them. Hundreds of beating tails make quite a noise. Kingfish, trevally, blue mau mau and koharu. This is what we're here for. Paul zeroes in on a kingfish but misses. Even the good guys have this problem. He's reloaded quickly and nailed an average sized kingfish. Letting it dangle below him may give the other guys a chance as a kingfish will circle a wounded mate. You have to be down and focused on what is around the wounded fish. Leaving them for too long is not good. This spot is notorious for big sharks. In this dirty water, a big visitor would be very unwelcome. Holding the kingfish and the gills upside down with your legs wrapped around it is the correct technique to use. Paul makes sure with a proper dagger style knife the kingy is properly dead before letting his grip go and then swims it back to the boat. These bait fish are very nervous, the kingies may still be close. One good kingfish is enough so we move on to find some mussels. Someone has given these guys one for a feed. You're allowed 25 per person around the Haraki Gulf. They're also very cheap to buy from a supermarket. Why then do people rape and pillage them and get huge fines that far exceed the cost of buying them? While Paul collects, Jason, my other dive mate, nails a tasty butterfish. He makes sure this one's completely dead as well. As I've said, struggling fish can attract big predators. It's also humane and looks after the meat. Jason replaces his knife into his wetty pouch. All wetty suits have these secure pouches to save losing your knife. Note Jason's Omer belt torch. These clip easily onto a holder on your belt to stay out of the way until you need them. They're great little cray hunting torches. Paul's still on the mussels. They make a great home for many little creatures. Check out these bright blue crabs. When taking mussels, it's easier to keep working the same patch and open up an area so they're not so tightly packed. The fish are still at the mussel burly. It's amazing how close you can get to some fish when they feed.
All the action in Fish on Floats has attracted this big ray. He'll steal your fish if you give him a chance. They're very strong and will suck a fish right off your float line. Kinners are another succulent delight. The bottom's covered in most places. The trick is finding the right ones. Jason's into them. He only needs a few to add to the catch for the day. Handle them carefully. The spines are very sharp. The weddy scallop power bag is perfect to store them in and it tows easily attached to your float. Dirty water has treated us well. If you're starting out in a new boat, whether it's a dinghy, a launch, a runabout, a centre console, sport fisher, you know, there are things that you can do to really help yourself. There's a phrase, you know, knowledge is power. And one of the things I think is very important, you can do a whole bunch of courses with the Coast Guard Boating Education Service. Now this is really valuable, like say if you're in a dinghy and you're upgrading to a, a bigger boat or runabout, you can learn the functionalities of things and how to use them, how to boat safely. If you're going from a, from a runabout to a launch, you know, there is a lot to learn. And I go in a lot of different boats and I tell you what, I'm always learning something about boating and boating safety. You know, mooring lines, anchoring, safe anchoring procedures, you know, what equipment you need to carry on all sorts of different boats, how to use your VHF radio. There is such a wealth of knowledge out there and like I say, you can do easy courses from beginners right up to advanced with the Coast Guard Boating Education Service. Knowledge is power. Coming up, tips on drag fishing, knots for tying braid, and my wife gets in on the action. Sometimes it can be tough working as a husband and wife team who both love to fish. My wife Nikki, who is also an accomplished angler, had been filming and wanted to get in on the action. So we agreed to take turns at catching fish. Probably a smart move on my behalf, if you know what I mean. Okay, so the drag fishing technique will show you in, in, in bits. First thing, obviously, you open your bale, release the line. Now with a fixed spool line, when you're releasing it back, if there's a really fast current, it's quite hard to know when you've hit the bottom. But usually the best indicator is your line will actually pause for a second or stop. And you know that you're in X amount, there you go, there's a pause, so I'm on the bottom. Flick the bale back open, and then we're just feeling for bites. Don't strike when you're drag fishing, the fish pretty much hook themselves because they're coming up and attacking the lure as it sort of puffs sand and, and goes past their face. So you you just hold your rod at water level, giving yourself plenty of room to absorb any, any strikes from the fish. And then once you've got the hook up, hold the rod up and don't go down again until you've got a couple of winds on the reel. Every once in a while, open the bale, lift your rod up, and drop another six to ten feet of line back that keeps your lure on the bottom and that seems to be when you get the most action is when you're dropping your line back and it tightens up all of a sudden and you'll get that's when the fish come onto the rod so that's the dragging technique it's pretty easy to master once you learn to hold the bottom and that's the key to it having enough weight on your head but not being overweighted and puffing the sand letting a little bit of line back at a time and wait for that bite There we go, got him. <laughs> it's like all fishing, you know, there's a little bit of technique involved. Master the technique and you get the bites. Don't be scared to try new things or do things different ways, even if someone says you've got to do it this way. If it works for you, it's the right way. This high vis braid makes it easy to see where the fish are. Get my landing net. A lot of people make the mistake of trying to lift fish on these light soft braid rods. Always use the landing net or lift it on the leader. 
and then you don't risk breaking your rod. Another one to let go. Drag fishing with soft baits definitely works. Nikki's form was great and she was a master of the drag fishing technique, catching a fish just about every drop. Is it a big one? She had changed her lure from the Street Z lure to a coconut ice jerk shad in hopes of nailing a larger fish with a bigger lure. Yeah. This is a tactic that often works well when the fishing is hot. Remember that a bigger lure may require a heavier jig head to hold the bottom. You really don't have to wait long for a bite. Um, basically every time you put your lure in the water. This one actually pulled a little bit of line, which is the first one that's done that, so they may be getting a little bit bigger. Definitely got to be have your wits around you. There's fairies everywhere. Um, I suppose it's part of the, the charm and part of the, the fishing in your backyard that uh, you've got to put up with things like that. It's definitely not wilderness fishing. Here he comes. Oh yeah, he's a nice fish. That's my limit for the day. It's not nine. Um, I'm only gonna keep four self-imposed limit but I'm happy catching fish like that we've only been on the water an hour and a half we've used about a 50 cents worth of gas we haven't even warmed the engine up it's uh, not necessarily a shakedown for the boat but it's a very very good christening it was great watching Nikki's technique when playing a fish on light gear Notice how she keeps the rod and reel well balanced. Her eyes are always watching the tip and maintaining a good curve in the rod while she is pumping the fish in and making sure not to give it any slack line. Yeah. So how many have you caught? Four. Four? You're supposed to be uh, working. <laughs> good day at the office, eh? And when the fish comes to the boat, Nikki leaves the fish to the net without winding the line in too far, making it easy to lift the rod and control the fish. These are all small points, but make a big difference when it comes to playing and landing fish. Well, one of the distinct advantages with a centre console boat is it gives your anglers two uh, areas to fish from. And you can also move around the boat depending on the windage and the way you're drifting to allow yourself to get the best possible position to work your lures. And it might sound silly, but if you get yourself uh, the lure in the right position by moving around the boat, it actually helps you catch fish. And it's quite a hard one to explain, but it does make a difference. The other thing is, if you've got two or three anglers on the boat, you can pop one guy up the front, have a couple down the stern, and um, really take full advantage of, of a centre console boat. So even in a small area, you can fit more anglers and uh, have more space to work your lures. We're starting to get towards the bottom of the tide, so the, the current has slackened off. 
and hence the bites have slackened off a bit. It's uh, one of the things you find with snapper when they come into the Waitemata Harbour, you need running current. And sometimes it doesn't matter if it's incoming or outgoing, sometimes it does. And other times you'll find that they bite best on the first two hours of the outgoing, or the bottom two hours of the outgoing, or the first two hours of the incoming. So, and it, that does tend to be affected by moon phase. So work the tides and see which ones work best, because you can really concentrate your fishing to the best times. And we've got another nice snapper here. Hooked in the mouth again. I'll let this one go, even though he's a nice one. There you go, fella. One of the questions I'm regularly asked is how do you join braid to mono? And my stock answer is I use a double uni knot, but some people even have trouble doing that. And sometimes you're in a real hurry and you want a quick, easy knot to join fluorocarbon to braid. And I'll give you one right now. Now it's gonna be pretty hard to see because the line's so fine, but what you wanna do is just double check it. If you go onto a website and type in seven turn surgeon's loop or seven times around surgeon's loop, and that's what I'm gonna do. And I'll show you how to do it. It's quite a simple knot, which is, uh, appeals to a lot of people. I'm not saying it's the best knot, but I'm saying it's quite simple. You get your two lines and you get them parallel to each other. And I'm using uh, four kilo uh, braid and 20 pound fluorocarbon. And then you basically tie a granny knot. But then you keep going round seven times. Hence the seven times around surgeon's loop. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Now the other key with this one is when you draw it up, obviously you have to wet it thoroughly, but also draw it up very carefully and take time to draw up the fluorocarbon and the braid and you pull on both the ends of fluorocarbon, both the ends of braid and pull it up nice and snugly. And then you trim off your tag ends. Now that's a relatively strong knot, I'm not saying it's the best one, but it's a really quick one when you want to tie fluorocarbon to braid when you're soft baiting and doing fishing like that. For heavier duty lures, you probably want to tie a more advanced knot, a stronger knot. But this will do for soft baiting with light tackle.